Good morning, church. My name is Pastor Ronaldo. It is always such a joy and an honor to be in the Word of God together. Would you join me in prayer, and then we will jump into our time in the Word together. Glorious God, we, we come to you, Lord, and we, we bend our knees in worship. We ask, God, that you would powerfully invade our lives with your word and transform us. Lord, transform us individually, but Lord, transform us as well as a body that, that reflects your gospel. We love you and we entrust this time into your hands, in your name, Jesus, amen. I am not, I am not telling you that this is what actually took place. All I'm saying is that if I was the enemy, this is what I would do. If I was the enemy, I would infiltrate the church and I would pollute it from the inside. I would poison it from the inside. Imagine the obstacles. Imagine the, the impediment. Imagine the obstructions, the obstructions to Jesus that, that I could build if I, as the enemy, could infiltrate poison, pollute the church from the inside, the scandals that would arise, the, the abuse of power, the racism, the misogyny, the greed, pastors residing in mansions and traveling in their own jet planes while people in their cities starve. The church members who look absolutely not different at all from their neighbors that have no relationship with Jesus. The church could be cold and the church has been often cold and, and lonely and, and irrelevant and anti-intellectual. And when you compile all of these things together, the, the church just walks away with a terrible reputation. And there, there exists this gigantic disparity, this, this gigantic discrepancy, this substantial gap between what we understand the church to be from the scriptures, the, the theological structuring, the, the biblical blueprint for what it is that, that the church was designed to be, this, this purchased by the blood of Christ, this created by the blood of Christ entity, this what, what Paul says to Timothy, uh, God's household, the, the, the pillar, the foundation of truth, that's what the church is created, designed, engineered, and architected to be. And what we often see today now, my heart's desire today is to course correct. And there will be many times, there will be many times where we, we gather together and we look at what scripture has to say, what our Bibles have to say about what the church is. But today, I want you to see it. I want you to see what the church once was so that you and I can think about what the church could be. I want you to see what the church once was so that perhaps we could envision and see what the church could yet be. Would you join me in Acts chapter 21? And when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Coes, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. 
And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais. And we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. The passage opens with these words. And when we had parted from them and set sail, there's a, there's a different translation that puts it this way. After we had torn ourselves away from them. And, and I love that translation because that particular translation quickly reminds us of what has been Paul in Acts 20 was with the church in Ephesus and, and, and they, were, they were attached. They were glued one to another and Paul leaves them with these parting words that, that he's not going to see them again or rather they won't see him again. They won't see his face again. And, 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 and with that, there is this parting there's this detachment or the way that the niv puts it we had to tear ourselves away from them it it, it reminds me of not too long ago the when i was at the viewing just before my mother's funeral I was there and, and, and I'm there and I'm, I'm, I'm in front of this casket and my mom's body is in there and I cannot pull myself away. I know she is not uh, uh, spiritually there. I know that that is just her, her cadaver or her corpse and yet I can't pull myself away and I'm, and I'm having conversations with her and I am reliving all of the pain that she has known and I'm, I'm reliving all of the joy that we had together. I am, I am thanking her. I am expressing my gratitude for all that she poured into me for my entire life and I had to tear myself away from them because from from there because I knew I knew that after that I would never again on this earth see her physical face you know I'm an, I'm a lover of old books I'm a lover of old books and 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 my nemesis is when people put a sticker on the cover of that old book because I don't want that sticker there. And so I try to, I try to pull it apart. I try to pull it away, but inevitably what happens every time is that when I pull them apart, a part of the book cover ends up on the sticker and a part of the sticker ends up on the book cover. There's this pulling away. There's this pulling apart, there's this tearing away that I didn't want to not see my mom anymore and they don't want to see, not to see Paul anymore. And, and, and so they have, to, they have to be torn away from one another. And my question is, do you see the church? Do you see what the church ought to be they're they're members one of another like 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 a like an arm and a torso are part of the same body and to tear one from the other is going to cause emotional pain 
and they have to be torn away one from another. But the reason why they do that is because there's a larger mission. So they tear themselves away one from each other and they set sail. They sail to the island of Kos, and then they sail to the island of Rhodes, and from there they go to the city of Patara, and they find a ship, and they cross over to Phoenicia. They, they get on board. They set sail. Then they go south of the island of Cyprus until they land at Tyre. And, and as you're reading this passage, as you're reading verses 2 and 3, if you read it too quickly— you and I end up superimposing our own itineraries, our own travel experiences into what's going on here. So, so we end up with this, with this pedestrian sense of what's happening here. We, 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 we think of duty-free shopping and, and magazines that you pick up and that you read while complaining that your layover is too long. But when we peek at Paul's own travel diary or what could be called his own travel diary or a glimpse of it in a, in a letter that he writes to the church in Corinth, he, he, he tells us that he was always in constant danger at times shipwrecked, at times imprisoned, at times beaten, at times stoned, always endangered by robbers, by, by bandits. He was endangered by Jews. He was endangered by Gentiles. He was endangered in the city. He was endangered in the country. He was endangered by false believers. He was without food at times. And, and, and as we piece this together, we're seeing Paul is tearing himself away from a church that he deeply loves and is deeply loved by him and that lo deeply love him. And he is, he is coursing through, he is navigating treacherous roads. He is navigating treacherous seas and he is doing all of this for a larger mission. Do you see the church interacting there? Do you see what the church is up to? Verse four tells us that when he lands in Tyre, in, in the city of Tyre, he seeks out the disciples, right? We, we tend to live our lives in isolated Christianity. We have over individualized Christianity. And we think it's, it's just me and God. It's just me, my Bible and God. And listen, your Bible is precious to you. My Bible is precious to me. Prayer is precious to me. But we're designed by the Spirit to be the church and something larger. We're designed to be a body. And so we see see this as we watch Paul's travels. When he gets to a place, he seeks out other disciples. He seeks out others who are following Jesus. And they're there for a few days. And at their departure, they all gather together. They hop on a beach, excuse me, and they hop on a ship. And then they keep going. Verse seven tells us that, that when they finished this voyage, they, they arrive at Ptolemais and they greet the brothers there. It's, there's, there's, there's always this community. The gospel has built together. The gospel has put together the spirit through the gospel, builds together this community, this new community, which is called the church which is on a mission together. And we begin to see it. Church, do you see the church? Do you see what the church ought to be? Do you see what the church once was? Pick up with me in verse eight. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea. And we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. 
While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart for I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Manasseh of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. I think we, we, as we read this, we see this warning. We see this warning of Paul of what awaits him in Jerusalem. And, and Agabus comes and, and he says, he takes Paul's belt and, and he just acts out. He just, he acts out this prophecy. He takes Paul's belt and he binds his own feet. He binds his own hands and says, this is what the Holy Spirit is saying. This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this and deliver him into the hands of Gentiles. Now, we don't want to see this as blind fate. We don't want to see this as fatalistic. This is what happens at the collision of the meteor of the gospel and the fortress, which is this world rebelling against its maker. The world in rebellion against God is this fortress and the gospel is a meteor colliding with it. And because of this, Paul is going to walk down a difficult road. Because of this, you and I will walk down a difficult road. Now, if you're familiar with the Apostle Paul, if you have familiarity with the Apostle Paul, his stance, what he says, what are you doing? What are you doing? Weeping, breaking my heart. Not only am I ready to be imprisoned, not only am I ready to be bound, but I'm ready even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, if you're familiar at all, even casually familiar with the Apostle Paul, this actually makes sense to you. This is no surprise to you. But I, but I want you to see, I want you to understand, not only that Paul is ready to be imprisoned and die for the name of the Lord Jesus, but, but why? Paul understands who Jesus is. He understands his savior. He understands salvation. He understands his king. He understands his kingdom. I, I, I think of Jesus' words to the, to the woman in Samaria where he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, the gift and, and, and the one that is offering this gift. And Paul has met that gift and the giver of the gift. And he has altered his entire life to live his life out for his savior, for his mediator between God and man, and for his king. Paul understands that on this earth, he's a foreigner. Paul understands that on this earth, he will always be a stranger. And he understands that he already is a citizen 
of a kingdom that is to come. He, he has his eyes set on the new earth. In other words, he can see past his own funeral. He can see past his own burial. He, he says when he writes a letter to, to the church in Rome, I consider that these present sur- sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. He, he has his eyes gripped on his Savior. He has his eyes gripped on his King. He, he says in Philippians, when, when he writes a, tr- uh, a letter to the church in Philippi, he says, for to me, to live is Christ and death is gain. Because of this mindset, because he is, he is living out for Christ Jesus, he says, listen, church, I know you're worried. I know you're concerned. They, they come around him and they're, they're, they're pleading with him. Not, they, they see the warnings. They have heard the warnings. And Paul appreciates that because it it flows out of love for him. And yet he sees past that. He sees past his own suffering. He sees past his own death. He sees past that. And because he sees beyond that, it changes the way that he views his current life. And my question to you is, do you see past? Do you see past your funeral? Do you see past your burial? Do you see beyond and allow that sight and allow that vision to alter how you live your life here and now? Do you see the gift and the giver of that gift or the way that Jesus said, if you knew the gift and who it is who says to you, if you and I know who it is that we are serving and church, the the savior and salvation, the king and his kingdom are better than every creaturely comfort that you and I can get here and now. Eternity with our King because because God became a human being, because God became man, because Jesus came this God-man who became our sin. Jesus becomes our sin and he dies in our place. And, and, and Paul says to the church in, 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 in Corinth that, that he did that as, as the first fruits, right? The idea of first fruits is that you give the first fruits because you trust that the fullness is coming. Right, So a gardener would take his first fruits and he would offer that up as trusting that the, the full harvest was coming. And, and Paul tells the church in Corinth that Jesus died as a first fruit, right? That, excuse me, that Jesus resurrected, that he resurrected, that he came back to life as the first fruits, right? Guaranteeing the full harvest. And so Paul knows that resurrection. Paul trusts in that resurrection. Paul believes in that resurrection. He knows that something greater is coming. So he says, I know. I, 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 I do not consider the present sufferings right now to be worthy to be compared with what is coming. And that leads him to say, Not only am I willing to be imprisoned, but I'm even willing to die for the name of the Lord Jesus. Ah, church, what I want for you is for you to know this very Jesus. 
which is worth our giving up everything else in pursuit of who he is. But I want you to see something about the church, right? There's this, in one sense, a disagreement, right? Those that are there in the city of Tyre, they are warning Paul not to go to Jerusalem because they think that will be bad for him. But Paul, who's also been interacting with the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is leading him to go to Jerusalem, right? So they, they, they come to heads, right? And, 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 but, I, but I want you to see the church at work. There's, there's, there's engagement and there's discernment. There's deliberation. There's conversation. There's prayer that goes into this. And Paul, in the context of the church, eventually comes to the conclusion. He goes, no, I'm right on this one. And they agree. And they say, let the will of the Lord be done. Verse 17, when we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that, had, that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God and they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus, all will know that there's nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. Now, Paul has arrived in Jerusalem. They have arrived in Jerusalem, and there has been warning after warning after warning. But when they first arrive in Jerusalem, the first thing that happens is that there's a warm reception by the church, by Paul's brothers in Christ, by Paul's sister in Christ, even though he has been warned about what's gonna happen in Jerusalem. I want you to see the church being the church. And the first thing that happens is there's this warm welcome. But after that, as soon as that happens, there is this understanding that false accusations have been made about Paul. Lies, something that is not true has been said about Paul. Now we want to not carelessly read this. We don't want to be lazy because if, if, if you read this a little bit too lazily, if you read this carelessly, it might seem that Paul is backpedaling or abandoning or compromising minimally what he has taught in the past, right? We, we, we might be thinking they're, they're, they're kind of right. They're kind of right. But if we look closely, if we microscope in and actually see what it is that they're saying, we will see that there's actually no substance to these false accusations that is being made about Paul. Paul has been preaching 
primarily but not exclusively to Gentiles. And what he is saying is that what you need for salvation is Christ and Christ alone. What it is that God did by sending Christ to die for our sins is sufficient for our salvation. There's nothing else that needs to be added. Primarily, when he preaches to the Gentile audience, he is saying, Gentile, You do not have to become a Jew first. You just come to Christ, and that is sufficient for your salvation. Now, what they're saying is, is actually the exact opposite, right? Paul is clear in saying the Gentile does not have to become a Jew to come to Christ. Just come to Christ. Just come to Jesus. But the accusation that they are hearing is that Paul is teaching the very opposite, that Jews have to abandon their Jewishness, that they have to forsake Moses, that they have not to be circumcised anymore. And that's actually not true at all. In the same way that the Gentile doesn't have to abandon his culture, has to abandon... and and, and have to assimilate to Jewish culture. They do not have to do that. In the same way, the Jew doesn't have to reverse that. The Jew does not have to abandon his own culture, right? I mean, we see that. Jesus, who was Jewish, in many ways followed the law, right? uh, He's the one that said, uh, I didn't come to, 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 to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it. Right? And, 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 and Paul himself, we have already seen him observe the law. And so there's these false accusations that are being made. But for the sake of that group of Jewish believers that are zealous for the law, that have misunderstood Paul based on accusations, that he is telling them not to be circumcised and not to walk according to the customs that Moses has taught. Paul goes right along with what he has been asked to do. Now, you might initially see that as his backpedaling or abandoning, but he's just doing what he has always said he would do or what he explains in one of his letters to the Corinthians, where he says, listen, to the Jew, I became a Jew. To the Gentile, I became a Gentile. To those under the law, I became as those under the law. To those not under the law, as not under the law. He's this chameleon whose singular desire, whose singular heartbeat is for them to come to know Jesus. And so he is always willing to be the one that adjusts. He is always willing to be the one that adapts so that they have no obstacles to come to Christ. And that's exactly what he does here, even though the things that have been said about him are false. And James, who's talking to them about this, knows they're false. He says, thus all will know that there's nothing in what they've been told about you. I want you to see Paul's compassion, Paul's humility for these believers that have misunderstood him to these believers that have been told falsehoods about him, he is very willing to submit himself to the church and go with what they're asking him to do. Now, I love these two stories right next to each other because previously the church said, we don't don't think you should go to Jerusalem. And he says, the Holy Spirit is leading me there. And Paul ends up saying, I'm right on this one. And now the church says, Paul, here's what we think you need you to do. And Paul goes, you're right on this one. Do you see the church at work? Do you see how it counters our over-individualized existence where we 
think arrogantly that we are on our own or arrogantly that we can do it on our own. Acts provides a a corrective and shows us a church in communication. Again, there's engagement, there's discernment, there's deliberation. They talk warmly. And this time, Paul goes with what they're asking him to do for the good of of the body. But there had been this saying, this, this, this false accusations that Paul was teaching that Jews needed to abandon their culture, that Jews needed to abandon their customs, that Jews needed to abandon their ways. And I, I want you to stay close. I want you to stay close because there's, there's some heavyweight implications to this. Paul is, 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 is famously known for saying, listen, circumcision or uncircumcision, neither of them matter. Neither of them bring substance. What matters is Christ. What matters is salvation in Christ alone. So it's not that this one is better than this one or this one is better than this one. What matters is Christ, and you don't have to assimilate. Now, I want you to notice the heavyweight implication for that in our lives. What matters is Christ. You do not have to culturally assimilate to a different culture. You do not have to abandon your own culture. You, as you are, just embrace Christ and come into the body. As I said, if I was the enemy, I would infiltrate and poison the church from the inside. And one of those ways that I would do that is I would add to the gospel by saying, oh, and you have to abandon the way that you were brought up. You have to abandon your upbringing. You have to abandon your culture. You have to abandon your ethnicity. You have to abandon But Paul says you do not have to do that. Not only does he, does he speak that, but more so he embodies that. He goes along with exactly what they ask him to do, to demonstrate that Jews can stay Jewish and come into the body of Christ, that Gentiles can remain Gentiles and come into the body of Christ. You do not have to assimilate to come into the body of Christ. Your culture, your ethnicity, your language, your upbringing, so much of that is God-ordained and it's beautiful. And we actually lose the beauty when we assimilate. Now, at times the church has explicitly out loud told us that we have to assimilate. At times it's implicit or subtle, hard to hear, but that we are asked or even demanded to assimilate. But that's not what the Spirit does. It's not what the Spirit did at Pentecost. What this, it's not what the Spirit did at Pentecost. It's not what the Spirit did throughout the book of Acts. It's not what the Spirit does. The Spirit brings you as you are, as God has uniquely created you to be a part of this body. You are not called to assimilate, and we see that right in these words. Abandoning your ethnicity to take on the ethnicity of another, abandoning your culture to take on the culture of another is not an aspect of the gospel. It's not what the Spirit does. In fact, what the Spirit does do, what the Spirit does is he conjoins, he, he, he attaches together what 
prior to his showing up, you couldn't imagine coming together. The spirit himself brings together. And I want to ask you the question, do you see what the church once was? Do you see what the church could be? Do you see what the church of the living God is? Do you see what, what Christ created with his own blood? Do you see what the spirit creates? by bringing together many from all kinds of ethnicities and languages and tribe groups and, 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 and all sorts of diversities. He brings them together under one name, the name of Christ. Do you see what the church once was and do you see what the church could be? Would you pray with me? Glorious, majestic, holy, beautiful, sovereign King. We bow. We ask that your Holy Spirit, God, would create this beautiful creation right here in Milwaukee by the gospel and the gospel alone. We love you. We trust you. We entrust ourselves to you in your holy and glorious name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ronaldo, for that amazing uh, word uh, on this week. I pray that uh, you would all take the sermon challenge this week and allow it to be manifested in your life, so others uh, come to know Jesus. Uh, you know, we teach here at You Flourish Church that uh, we don't just want to have head knowledge, but we want to live out our faith in ways that will impact the spaces and places that we occupy. Uh, now that you had an opportunity to uh, participate in the ministry of the word, I pray that you would join me in the ministry of giving. Uh, here at You Flourish Church, we have two ways that you can give and uh, one is uh, you can text uh, the dollar amount uh, you want to give to the number 84321 or you can go to our website at helpingyouflourish.org uh, and you could make uh, a donation there. Uh, do remember that there's no gift uh, too small and we don't want you to feel guilted in giving, but uh, we do believe that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Thank you so much for your giving and may God bless you.